broad term, relationships. Relationships. Now, I think all of us, to some degree, are interested in relationships. I don't want to see any hands here. But they affect us. There are all kinds of different relationships. But when we especially think about, you know, as we start getting a little older and kind of thinking about, you know, plans for life and what am I going to do? You know, who am I going to be with? Do you think that Jesus created relationships for good? Was it his plan in the beginning to give Adam a companion and all that? Was that a, a wonderful plan from God? Has the devil counterfeited this and twisted it and made it really, really painful and ugly and broken families? He has. One of the things that, that I, I learned from my mom's journals is that apparently my, my dad had a struggle with sexual immorality. I won't go into detail, but I will just simply say this. When there is unfaithfulness between a father and a mother in their, in their relationship, it can really affect the kids. It can. But here's the good news. Even if you came from a family where there was different things that were wrong going on, Jesus says, I will give you a new start. Isn't that neat? Like, you don't have to repeat whatever mistakes your parents made. You can say, I have a heavenly father. That's who I claim as my father. Now, I'm thankful that God gave me an earthly dad that gave me life, but I'm thankful to have been adopted into the family of God. And I invite you to turn with me to Genesis chapter 2 as you look at God's original beautiful plan for relationships, and then we're going to realize that all of Jesus' emergency text notifications are simply warnings to not veer off of his best for us. Genesis 2, starting in verse 18. Genesis chapter 2, we're looking at verse 18. And to give you a little bit of context when this really made sense to me, I was actually, during the summer of 2008, going canvassing door-to-door. -door. And if any of you have experienced that, how many have you ever gone canvassing or door-to-door? -door? All right, number of hands have gone out a little bit. Um, I remember that there were some young people, they were probably in their early 20s, that were doing a worship with us, and I think it was a Sabbath afternoon, actually. And what they said really has stuck with me today, to this day. And... I'll be honest with you, I think one of the areas the devil tries to get us is he wants to push us into looking for relationships when we're not ready yet. And one of the things that really stood out to me was that, it's just right here in the text, you don't see God giving Adam a companion until Adam has a place to live and has his employment. Now, there's, there's some truth to be said that we're often tempted to rush into finding a companion when we're still living with mom and dad, and we don't have a job, how are we going to support a family? So thankfully, God's plan is always best. There is a time and an order in everything. If you think about it, God, God only does this because he cares about us. Genesis 2, verse 18. And the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all cattle, to the birds of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper comparable to him. Now, do you think Adam had a pretty amazing job? I'd have to say he did. He got to name every single animal. So he knew every single living species on the whole planet. He got to name them. He knew them. He cared about them. But the more he did in his work, the more it became clear to him that there was no one else similar to him. All the cats had a male and female, and all the dogs and every single species, but there wasn't anyone like him. And so it was as he began to realize his need as he was out serving God and what God had given him to do in his garden home that we read in verse 21, Genesis 2. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Verse 24. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother, and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Now, you might say, well, we've probably heard this before in regard to Genesis being the first plan for family. But 
the truth is there are all kinds of different diversions from this. I know when I was in college, I remember I started um, dating someone and the kind of things we were doing together, I would honestly say were worldly and selfish. And looking back on it, I realized I caused myself a little bit of a heartache by that relationship. And I don't really know where she is these days, but I don't know how close she is with God. And the truth is, if you haven't put Jesus first and let him first guide you in what you're going to be doing in life and how you're going to be serving God, then sometimes rushing into something that's just trying to make you happy is actually going to hurt you. Uh, I would have been better off without having some of those experiences. But looking back, I'm really thankful that God is merciful and that he can forgive us if we've fallen in these areas. But he warns us, this is his plan. This is his best for us. And I still remember hearing that, that worship we had with our canvassing leaders, that it really stood out to me that it's better to wait and make sure that God chooses those things first and then be ready. Otherwise, you're going to end up with things all out of order. And you might end up with all kinds of heartache, having children before you really have a place to live, and all these things. The devil is all about scrambling God's plan for family. Now, you and I, in the last few years, live in what is probably one of the most historic changes in America, and that is the shift in far, as far as the definition of even what marriage or family is. Let's turn now to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. It just so happened in my uh, Bible reading, I was in this chapter this morning, I was already planning to share it today, but in Romans 1, we find that Jesus, through his servant, the Apostle Paul, gives us a warning about the kind of things that happen when our hearts are not fully connected to him, when we're not filled with his selfless love. And this is Romans chapter 1, and we're looking at verse 26 and 27. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men, committing what is shameful, and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. Now, this passage probably doesn't need a lot of explanation, but in 2015, the Supreme Court basically said, any two people makes a marriage. What did Jesus say in Genesis? It's a man and a woman. Now, there's a reason why God is specific. Because he knows that anything less than his ideal is actually based on a different principle of, quote-unquote, love. There is selfless love that Jesus gives us, and there is selfish love that we seek for ourselves. Everything that is not from Jesus is underlying selfish. And would you be happy with someone that's selfish? For the rest of your life? No. Would you want to be with someone who is selflessly thinking, how can I bless them? And you're not trying to get into that relationship simply because you want to get blessed. It's the same for you. If you have Jesus, you want to bless them. That's what heaven is going to be like. That's why if we follow God's plan for relationships, we're actually getting a foretaste of heaven. It's pretty simple, but if we will wait upon God and actually ask him to give us his ideal, we will be so blessed. Jesus loves us so much to give us the opportunity to wait for him. I've heard it said that true love waits. In other words, we're willing to wait for God's time or his plan. And ultimately, the prayers that we're probably going to be praying more is, Lord, make me the man or woman that you want me to be, that I could be a blessing to others. That's the kind of prayer. That's the kind of character he wants us to have. Now, there's another area. And I've already touched on it a little bit in my testimony, but that would be the area of music or the things that we put into our minds. Return with me in your Bibles to Philippians 4, verse 8. Philippians 4 and verse 8. Here, the Apostle Paul gives us an encouragement as to what would be fitting for us to fill our hearts and our lives with. Philippians 4 and verse 8. Philippians chapter 4, we're looking at verse 8. Philippians 4 and verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true... 
Whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Would you agree with me that there is a lot of music out there that doesn't meet any of that criteria? Yeah, if it doesn't meet any of that criteria, it's clearly not good. What if it meets all of them except one? Is it still good for us to put in our lives? No. Because the truth is that there may be something that's actually true, but it's not lovely or not praiseworthy. And there is so much out there that can distract us, but I just want to praise the Lord. God has beautiful music for us. He has beautiful things we can put into our minds. And if we're willing to look for them, we can find them. Now, if we're just going to take anything that seems to come along and put it into our lives because our friends are doing it or it seems okay, we're going to honestly find that our minds more readily go to that direction than the direction that's going to help us be connected to Jesus. In our uh, last year's theme song about walking with Jesus, it talked about receive a living connection, be born from above. All the fruits of the Spirit will be revealed through his love. So if you've begun that connection with Christ by giving him your heart, do you think we need to keep that connection going? Yes. Do you think the devil's trying to, to break that connection by getting our minds off of Jesus? Absolutely. I think one of the best illustrations for our mind is that your mind is a lot like a radio receiver. You can choose to tune the station to listen to Jesus' voice, be meditating on him and his promises, or you can tune that station, or sometimes you don't even have to try to tune it. You just let it go back to where it seems to naturally wander away. And it's inevitably going back to something that's not Philippians 4.8. And as I shared in my testimony, I had been strongly addicted to rock music, but Jesus lovingly said, you don't like this anymore. In other words, who he was making me to become in him, a new creature, 2 Corinthians 5.17, didn't have to hold on to that anymore. And so he helped me to delete that and to begin finding new songs to praise him. So each one of us has an opportunity to choose what are we going to fill our hearts and our lives with. And another area that often we find is the devil's attempt to pull us away from Jesus is in the area of movies and media. Because there's a simple principle that Jesus knows, and it's in 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18. 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18. But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. That's Jesus' plan for us. He wants us to be transformed, to be more and more like him every single day. The time that you spend with Jesus is like gold. The time that you get to be with him out in nature, in, in his Sabbath day, is so precious. But if we fill our hearts and our minds and our time with media that it's full of violence and the very sins that the Bible says are not right, then we're going to be changed into that image more and more. And this is honestly part of my own testimony experience. I remember at times going to the movies and saying, as it were a prayer, Lord, forgive me for what I'm about to watch. That was presumption. God doesn't want us to ask him to forgive us for the sins we're about to commit. He wants us to ask him to keep us from the sin first. Does that make sense? I mean, if there's something being glorified in that media or that TV program that is sinful, then if we say, oh, I want to just take that in and, and that, that looks funny or that, that makes me feel a certain way, then actually if we enjoy looking at that, then it's like we've committed the sin ourselves. And Jesus says, I want to protect you from all that. I want you to have a sensitive conscience to evil and to love me and to have a sensitive heart to be filled with love. Do you want to have a sensitive heart for Jesus? Like that you're ready to hear his voice. Amen. When we have a sensitive heart to what he wants for us, then we're going to be ready not only to receive his blessings, but to be there to be alert when there's that emergency text notification. Jesus says, don't go there. That's not safe. I want to protect you from getting hurt. I want to protect you from the evil one who's trying to destroy your life. Now, Jesus in his life and ministry ministered to a lot of different kinds of people. And I remember last summer 
having experience that was 